Good evening and welcome to a Q&A for one of my favorite films of the festival. Uh, absolutely amazing, Warrior Spirit. And we have the filmmaker here, James is gonna be, gonna be a moderating this. I'm really, really excited. My name's Ivan Wiener. I'm the executive director of the Albuquerque Film and Music Experience. And on behalf of the entire organization, thanks so much for being part of AFMX 2021, the virtual experience. Before we get started, have to thank our sponsors. It would not happen without them. AFME Foundation is uh, you know, our main organization, Albuquerque Film Office and Film Liaison Cindy McCrossan, Bernalillo County Commissioner Stephen Michael Cazada, Albuquerque the Magazine, Breza Terrena Olive Oil, Comcast NBC Universal, Real Solutions Airport Meet and Greet Service, Sunny 505, the Baker Law Group, University of New Mexico Film and Digital Arts, Wells Fargo Advisors and Larry Schwartz, Yamaha Entertainment Group, and Jelska Road Productions. For the complete lineup of all of our films, log into afmxnm.com to today and get your tickets for the rest of the weekend and for some of the events that you may have missed. I want to introduce our moderator, James Glover uh, from Los Angeles right now. Um, he's a producer and a director, but a native of Santa Fe, New Mexico. Uh, he was born there um, and he became very enamored with film at an early age. Uh, attending the University of New Mexico and USC Film School, James has now uh, produced content for Fox, MTV, Comedy Central, and has an Emmy for his work with Fox Sports. He's currently producing a feature slated for release in fall of 2022, and he's one of AFMX's most beloved moderators. James, welcome back. This is, I think, your second one today, and you have a third one, too, after this, later on this evening. We're having some nice conversations with some incredible filmmakers, and uh, I, I'm so glad I get to continue that this evening with Landon. Uh, Warrior Spirit is an absolutely incredible journey. Uh, I, I always think of, um, I always love the line in those monster truck uh, commercials where they say, we'll sell you the whole seat, but you only need the edge. And that is certainly how I felt watching this, this film. Um, at no point does anybody, audience included, get a chance to relax. And it, um, wow, what a film. So Landon, I am absolutely thrilled to get a chance to talk with you uh, today about this film. And it looks like we're having a little bit of technical whatever. So we're gonna switch to this for now. We'll get okay. this sorted out. Um, so- How are you guys doing? Thank you guys uh, for having us. And uh, you know, on behalf of myself, our presenter, Warrior CBD, our executive producers, Jason Bowles, Nancy Murphy Bowles, my wife, Ashley, everybody who worked on the Warrior Spirit documentary. We appreciate the support and we also appreciate all the conversation about the film as it is a conversation starter. <laughs> now, and thank you so much for, for, for sharing your work with us. Um, I kind of just want to just jump right in with some questions that I had about the film. Um, sure. I, I, I'm curious how you how you came to be how you came to know Nico or be aware of Nico as a as a subject for uh, a longer form piece of documentary work. Sure. Yeah, we came into contact with Nico. Um, well, we actually our first documentary film, The Proving Grounds, was about Greg Jackson's MMA gym there in Albuquerque, and it was called The Proving Grounds. Had some of the biggest names in mixed martial yeah. arts, hometown heroes like Holly Holm. Uh, guys like Carlos Conda, Diego Sanchez, John Jones. Um, and we had been in the MS, MMA, um, introduced to the MMA industry through that project. And so we knew about Fit NHB and Coach Tom Vaughn and Arlene Sanchez Vaughn were products of the Greg Jackson system. Um, they, they came from that same school of martial arts. And so we had known about them. And then of course, with Nico's run, the end of 2017, to win the Ultimate Fighter Championship. We thought it would be a tremendous story because she trained at a fit NHB and she was is the first ever Native American UFC champion. And so with the Albuquerque ties um, with myself and our executive producers, Jason and Nancy, we reached out to Nico and asked her if we could share her story. 
and she was all for it. And that's how the project came about. Can you hear me okay? Let's see, can you hear me? Okay, sorry, technical stuff always comes up, you know. Um, that, that, that's, there's quite a bit of, of, of drama and story that obviously comes along with professional athletes as they pursue greatness. James, I'm having a hard time hearing you. Can you hear me Let's okay? See. I, I can't can hear, hear you, you okay. Though. Melody, give me a thumbs up or thumbs down. Can you hear me okay? Okay. Uh, barely. Um, okay. It's like the mic's not picking up really. Hmm. That's strange. Let's see. Let's see if we can slug through I'm not it. Sure. Um, let me try something. Okay. Try now. All right. How are you doing now? I can hear you better now. Let's try. Hey, let's do that. There we go. All right. Excellent. Um, what I was saying was with uh, with professional athletes, there's quite a bit of drama always as they. Mm -hmm you know, chase their dreams or chase the belt or chase greatness. Um, what was it about Nico that was such a, a interesting storyline to you? Um, obviously, yeah. there's a great deal of, of, of richness in her story, given where she's from and, and her culture and things like that haven't been fully explored. Um, mm -hmm. But I'm curious about how you, how you dug into the story and uh, how you chose or where you chose to begin and stuff. Sure. Um, well, Nico is the first Native American UFC champion. There's not even another Native American fighter in the UFC, as far as I know. And uh, she comes from the Wukachukai Reservation in Arizona. So basically, we had the idea of telling what would be considered like a modern day Rocky story, where Nico is set to face the formidable Russian opponent, Valentina Shevchenko, who is kind of like the modern day female version of Dolph Lundgren uh, from Rocky, Drago, if you will. So uh, we thought that would be an incredible story because she was set to face her first title defense versus Valentina leading into UFC 228, as you saw in the film. So that was uh, of interest to us. And then of course, her story being a Native American is uh, unfortunately, it's, it's, there's still a lot of similarities with the way the UFC is run and the way Dana White treats his fighters, exploiting them, as you can see with Nico, promising them things like title and all the riches and glory, and yet everything can be pulled out from under you at the end. So uh, in that way, it eerily parallels how our country has treated Native Americans, unfortunately. Um, so there's a few, you know, the microcosm is, is, is the story, the weight cutting, the fighter rights and the macro story, of course, is, uh, you know, what we've done and how we've exploited people in our country, uh, particularly the native Americans coming and taking stuff that's theirs, promising them things, and then ripping it out from them at the end. It's unfortunate. It definitely, it, it parallels a lot of storylines that, Unfortunately, we see sort of over and over in American history where it's mm -hmm. the exploitation of someone for someone else's gain. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that that's, I, I, I was going to touch on that a little, a little bit later, but I, I kind of want to talk about it now because as you get to the end of the film, sure. you sort of went through how, how things have changed or not changed, which they haven't changed very much at all in terms of how mm -hmm. the UFC relates to their fighters. Um, what was kind of the conversation as you got to that point where you were watching this entity, this business, uh, profiting off sure. of an individual that doesn't really see that same reciprocation? Well, what's crazy for Nico's story in particular is that her weight cut was managed by the UFC Performance Institute, which advertises that we can help you make weight safely. We do it the right way. We got all the best science, data, technology to make this work. As you see in the conversation about a third of the way through the film, the director of nutrition, Clint Wattenberg, is instructing Nico that, hey, I think we've made 125 before. It's going to be a steep cut, but we can do it. We can do it. We've done it before. And in fact, Nico, all of her weight cuts before that have been successful. 
but there were many other factors. She was coming off the show. She had tonsillitis surgery, the foot injury. They knew about all these things. They had an opportunity to push the fight back. They didn't do that. Why? Hmm. I don't know. Maybe is there a narrative to get the Russian superstar, the blonde hair, blue eyed girl as the champion because it looks better for the brand? Maybe, maybe not. But the, the fact is the UFC PI who was there to help her and recommended they take a later date. They, they didn't do it. So what is the point of it? Is it just there for show? And on top of that, going back to Nico's title and how she was treated, um, there's other UFC fighters who have missed weight and their belt hasn't been stripped. Max Holloway is an example. He's a very popular fighter who missed weight. His belt didn't get stripped. Why was Nico stripped the very first time she missed weight, especially knowing the circumstances she was coming from? On top of that, the ultimate fighter, you have several fights in a row. It, it, it's known that it can screw up your metabolism and how it works. They knew that stacking those weight cuts is dangerous and makes the weight cutting worse and worse. You hear Clint talk about it in the film and Nico and her boyfriend. Why was nothing done about that? Why was there no more regulation and safety and help? You know, uh, it, it's very tragic. So when you talk about the UFC, a multi-million dollar, now a billion dollar company says they run towards sanctioning and regulation then why is weight cutting still the way it is? Why are fighters not getting health benefits? Why is there no pension? Why do they have the lowest revenue share of any pro sport in the country? NBA, NFL, NHL, they pay their fighter uh, athletes 40 to 50%. UFC gets a measly 12 to 16 to 18%. It's criminal. It's crazy. So when they say it's run like a mob style business, it is. Well, and I think whenever you have whenever you have it's a I mean, it's a pyramid scheme so whenever you have somebody that sits at the top and controls the reins that aggressively like dana white does it, it puts the commodity which is the fighter um at risk of being exploited at every opportunity and i felt like watching the film it was nico being prop she was a prop to uh whatever the agenda ultimately was and it, it to, to a certain degree even talking about uh when she talked about Navajos don't wear headdresses and things like that. Like it was all of this, like it was a show that they were trying to put on at her expense. Um, what was the, what was the sort of the sentiment for Nico's camp with that kind of idea? Did, did she at one, at any point feel like that? And how did that affect sort of her ability to go to carry on with it? Sure. I, I mean, Nico's got a great personality and an incredibly strong will, a, a true warrior spirit. You saw her push it to the very edge to try to make things work. Um, and, and for her, you know, it, it's, it's, it's what all minorities and people face in this country with stereotypes and having to live in this America that is predominantly controlled by the older white affluent male. So it, you know, for Nika, you know, you can almost hear it, it's, she's like, yeah, the headdresses are trying to get me to do all that, but we're, I'm not trying to do that. You know what I mean? I'm a fighter. I'm a regular person. You know, I, I want to be represented and pushed as an athlete that has done something incredible by winning these fights, which she did on the ultimate fighter. They say she was a paper champ, but she went through some of the biggest names in the UFC, Roxanne Mataferi. Lauren Murphy, who's about to fight Valentina Shevchenko this weekend, many others as well. So the way she was treated and because of her uh, being a Native American, there's just, uh, unfortunately, it digs up some dark and, and ugly stereotypes. And I, I think they should be looked at. Um, and hopefully the film starts that conversation and also creates a conversation about regulation and sanctioning and safety, because guess what? When a fighter doesn't make a fight, the UFC loses money. The fans don't get to see their favorite fighter. Nico Montano has the whole Navajo nation behind her. People want to see her fight. So for them to do that the way they did and treat her the way they did, it, it's, uh, you know, it brings up some red flags and some serious issues. Many fighters are afraid to talk about this because they are afraid they'll get cut. They'll get put on the shelf or they'll get stepped on by Dana White and they won't have a job. So that's why they don't talk about it. And, uh, you know, you hear Tim Means uh, from Albuquerque, from Fit NHB, go into it a little bit. 
about you know the discrepancies with how fighters are treated. Um, why do they have? Why does the champion have to do all this media on fight week, fight week, and lose twenty pounds in four days? She can't water load. She can't get the rest she needs, and she can't cut the weight. It's crazy. You hear her asking them, "Can I do the Yahoo interview like on the phone or the week before?" I don't want to do it the fight during fight week. I already have a million things going on. No, we we need to do that one. That's the biggest press. But at the end of the day, because she doesn't make the weight. They don't even get paid for any of that. So independent contractor versus employee, the people who take pictures for the UFC and check people in, they have health insurance. Why is she being sent a copay for the bill for going to the hospital for trying to cut the weight to make the fight against the better judgment of the UFC Performance Institute's nutritionist? That's crazy. Well, and I... I found it so interesting because I, I saw the nutritious nutritionist as like this kind of sympathetic character that like was a bad guy by proxy. You know what I mean? Like he, he wasn't necessarily the villain of the film, but then he ends up having to sort of advocate for both the fighter and UFC one in the same. How, let, let, how let's did... be honest. Clint's not the bad guy. Right, Valentina's yeah. not the bad guy. No, the guy, yeah. the guy who needs to be looked at is the guy pulling all the strings. And we all know who that is. That's Dana White. And guess what? I'm a fan of the UFC. I have nothing against the guy. But when you are making millions of dollars and now a billion dollar company Mm -hmm. and you have the resources to take care of your athletes, you need to take care of them. It, 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 you know, in Amazon factories and Ford factories, they have regulations and safeties for a reason to protect the workers without the fighters. What does the UFC have? Nothing. So you got to take care of them. And there's much better ways to do these things, especially weight cutting. Now let's take it one step further with the weight cutting. It's an archaic process. No other sport do you deplete yourself to nothing before you're going to go compete for your life. Literally, you're risking your life when you step in the octagon. Now, what happens when you're depleted of all the nutrients and everything? There's a higher chance of you getting knocked out. That's great because we live in a social media world, a meme world where that five second viral knockout is the best publicity you could get. So why do you think the UFC keeps it that way? I mean, there's just a lot of stuff that needs to be looked at with that. <clears throat> so I love that your sort of your exploration of this topic is so deep. Whenever you started out making this film, I mean, obviously, cause you you've made UFC content documentaries before you were mm-hmm. sort of aware of some of these perils, but whenever you started out making this documentary, did you, did you know that that was going to become such a, a significant part of the story? Some of these, the trials and tribulations that the fighters have in their relationship with UFC. No, we, we have no problem with the UFC. We've worked with them. So for us, to anybody who thinks we tried to expose them on purpose, it's, it's not true. The film took a left turn at the UFC Performance Institute. In fact, we didn't even know she was doing her weight cut there because she had done all of her weight cuts with her own camps before that. So we just came to film the data and the cool testing, you know, all the great stuff that they do, knowing that they were going to get the job done for her. But, you know, like a, all great documentaries do, they follow the branches and the roads that are presented in the story. And if that branch ends up being the branch that leads to the highway, that leads to the bigger picture, that becomes the story. That becomes the spine of the story. So that was something we had a, a finger on our pulse uh, of that story. But fighter health and safety is always an issue, whether you're talking about CTE, uh, you know, trauma, um, you, know, it, it, you know, weight cutting. All these things are, are real issues and not having... Um, medical benefits and health insurance from the company that puts you in these positions, uh, that, that is also another red flag, you know, that needs to be brought up. Why, why is there no true health insurance for these guys that are being sent to the hospital literally after every fight? But that's not, that's not even the weight cutting. The weight cutting is sending them to the hospital too. Right. There's sort of, there's sort of pitfalls at every stage. Sure. Um, that's not being addressed. One thing that I, I want to touch on, and it and it ties in really heavily into the into their ability to fight, is their mental health. And the thing that was the most striking to me was Nico's like 
unwavering commitment and positivity. Um, at no point, even when the when she was on the verge of going to the hospital, did she mm-hmm. ever express the desire that this isn't worth it, or this is too much, or it's it's beyond my, it's 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 beyond the point of where I see value in this. She never she never got to that point. Um, can you kind of speak to to sort of how Nico was able to persevere so headstrong? Yeah, I mean Nico, like her tradition embodies is a true warrior. And what's great about the film is that now people can see that she did everything in her power to make the way to get to the fight. She was not ducking Valentina as some people speculated, like the journalist uh, Ariel Hawani and, and other fans and you know keyboard warriors. Uh, Nico, her story will live on for a long time because this is going to be a film that that's potentially going to change the rules of combat sports rules around weight cutting health insurance benefits all these things as more and more people start to talk about it but uh nico's story is tragic but she is a hero she's a protagonist she reminds me of uh, a version of a colin kaepernick type of figure where they take the fall for everybody else to make things better. And, uh, and, and by you know, her being so vulnerable and being able to document this process, it's not a comfortable one. You know? And uh, unfortunately, not all good things end well and not every fairy tale has a happy ending, but maybe somehow with the film and the advocating that people will do after watching it, there will be a happy ending and a better path forward for all fighters and also um, people of different backgrounds in this country, because that is also still very much an issue. I think that speaks to the point of sometimes you choose the fight and sometimes the fight chooses you. And it really seems like in this case, the fight chose Nico. That's Um, great. Yeah, that's great. but it found somebody with a great deal of, of personal strength and, and a community of support behind her. So, you know, perhaps she is the one to take up this fight. Um, I want to ask you, uh, how did you handle UFC and the things that they asked you not to film, the things that uh, you knew were critical to the story? That at, at, How involved was UFC in what you were allowed to shoot and not shoot? How how much of a finger on the scale did they have? Uh, well, as you can see, they, you know, we were granted permission to shoot in, in the, in the PI and all that. So we, we have all that stuff. Um, er- everything was done the right way. Like I said, this story took a turn on its head that no one thought it was going to take. Now, these guys who do weight cutting weekend, week out, guys like Clint and other dietitians, and of course, fighters and coaches, they know what goes on behind the scenes. Um, Nico's story just happens to be documented and uh, exponentially worse because the Performance Institute guided her weight cut in in this process and literally almost killed her. And she's not the first one and she won't be the last one. There are so many other fighters who have been through this. Um, But, you know, the, the problem is, you know, it's like Brian Gumbel said in our HBO piece on real sports about, you know, weight cutting. He said, uh, the UFC PI failed that woman. Is it there just for show? And it feels like it is a little bit because at the end of the day, the UFC is a giant PR machine. Um, and the way they spin things or try to a- avoid talking about things till it goes out of the news cycle is the way they handle negative press. Unfortunately, this film is going to stick around and play a lot of festivals and release on a wide platform to a wide audience. And people are going to be forced to talk about these issues and make some corrections. And and that's the goal. And a lot of people are going to have to thank Nico and the other people involved. And Clint is trying to do the right thing. Clint Wattenberg from USCPI and those guys, um, they really are. Uh, It's just the the way the system's set up. It's not beneficial for anybody. And, uh, Changes need to be made. <laughs> I want to shift gears just a little bit and talk about sort of Nico's hometown and sure. how uh, how how her 
how her being a Native American um, sort of informed how you how you chose to to explore that that aspect of her life. And I also kind of like if if you can talk to it, I want to know how it was how the film has been received by her community and and um, sure what kind of impact yeah. it's had. Yeah, uh, Nico is backed 100% by the Navajo Nation, Native American communities, and, and all of her friends and fans. What she did hasn't been done before by any indigenous fighters, and uh, and that will live on in itself. And um, you know, she's got 100% support, and that that will that hasn't changed. You know, um, unfortunately, there's always going to be people who talk. Uh, and say negative things be, behind the keyboard, behind social media and, and different things like that. So there, there will always be that. But uh, anybody who's watched the film or, or knows Nico knows that she is truly a fighter and an incredible person. Uh, so it's been received well. Of course, no one likes to see their hero fall, you know. Um, but uh, like we said earlier, you know, sometimes it takes someone falling to to help lift everybody else up. And uh, maybe that's what this will do in her story. And that's why it's such an important one, you know? Um, it's, uh, she started, you know, she's, she's a champion. So, I mean, whether people wanna say sh what they wanna say, go back and watch the film and see if you could put yourself through the stuff she put herself. And 99% of people in this world could not go through what she went through and keep pushing. So always kudos to her. She's backed by us and uh, the support of fighters everywhere and obviously the Native American community everywhere. So it's an important story. And, and of course, there's a macro story to that. She talks about, you know, during that walk back as she's heading out of the sauna back up to the hotel room where she mentions a lot of important things. Those were conversations with reporters during fight week where she was using her platform to bring up bigger issues. Uh, you know, the things that Native Americans are getting in school and what, 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 what we as a society consider a successful person, the nine to five middle-class American has got a corporate job. That's the way things should be. But we've all seen during COVID that that model might not work. It might not be what everybody says it is to be. And uh, you know what I mean? But Native Americans have, have faced these times kind of uh troubles and and um deficits for a long time now so it's not new you know what i mean and they're still dealing with those things where she's from a Lukachukai reservation they have to go you know uh you know two hour drives to pick up water and groceries still and things of that nature because they don't have them when she goes back to her community to start a fight camp she has to bring a cooler of food from the city because they don't have the resources there where she's from just to try to maintain weight and, and start her diet properly because what they have there is, is just, you know, the, the bare minimum because they, they don't have the support. Things have been ripped away. Things have been taken from them. And uh, unfortunately that, that is still the case today. It's, there is so, there, in American history and how, uh, how, the, throughout American history, that the Native American has been victimized by the greater, the larger whole of colonizer society, right? And mm -hmm. it, and it's, and it, it's amazing to me that hun a couple hundred years later, or several hundred years later, mm -hmm. at this point, uh, it, it, it is, it is a problem that has persisted um, without fail. Uh, there are so many underserved Native American communities in the United States, yet it falls far under the radar. And I think that documentaries like yours that call attention to the pitfalls in society are so important because it's through uh, artistic medium that a lot, of, a lot of change can be made. And I, 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 I'm curious, how, how has the reception from the film been by the, by the fighter community? Um, what, what, what sort of experience have you had with other fighters having seen the documentary and, and, and your, in your conversations with them? Uh, fighters know this is going on <laughs> and you see them rumbling and griping about it all the time, whether it be through a tweet or through a mention. Um, and a lot of the times the things aren't documented, the injustices, for example, but 
now they are. They're, they're clearly documented in our, our film Warrior Spirit. But this happens with all kinds of people. And so I, I think there's going to be a snowball effect where uh, as more and more fighters and, and this plays around the country and different fil film festivals into wider audience on streaming platforms is that they're going to realize we need to speak up and collectively get together to improve things for ourselves. We need to unionize. Uh, people have tried to do this. Fighters like Leslie Smith, who was ostracized and put on the shelf by the UFC, finally released by the UFC and, and try to start a union. But people look at her as like, uh, she's, she's just bitter because she got cut from the UFC or, or something of that nature. Um, so when are fighters gonna speak up and when are bigger media outlets gonna help support these type of stories? The problem is the UFC pays most of their MMA media and all the managers that work for them and all this stuff. So no one wants to poke the bear. Um, and and that, that's part of the issue, you know, until you get together and, and come together for some real change, it's, it's gonna be hard to change things. It's, it's still gonna be you know, an uphill battle for them until they unify and realize that their power as the fighters is that without the fighters, the UFC doesn't have anything. So together they can make the change. They got to, they got to get together. They got to work together. Um, I think Nico could help lead that movement with her story because she has the backing and the documentation of the injustices and some of the behavior is downright negligent. You know, it really is. I hope it doesn't get to a point where somebody has a tragedy happen before action is taken. And there's a someone favorite... will die. Someone will die before something changes. It, no, and that's, that's the, the case, people yeah. have died in weight cutting already. So it's ridiculous that we're not pushing towards real regulation and safety, hydration testing, or some type of, you know, you can only be a certain percentage over your walk around weight, right? Like there, there's just no real, there's loose and fast rules that have tons of loopholes, but no real rules that ensure safety, right? Because the, when the fighter's kidneys are shutting down, that leads to a stroke. When you have stroke, you can die, you know, and, and, and these things happen and, and they will, there will be more until a change is made. But why wait until the catastrophe when you can help fix something and still get super great fights and entertainment and, and everybody wins there, you know, it's, it's unfortunate. I think you know, the boy, those... the boyfriend says it in the film, you know, it's going to take someone dying mm -hmm. before change is made. And I think he's right. <clears throat> that was uh, such a, a poignant moment in the film whenever he said that, because it really did shine the brightest light on the fact that there is just not the level of concern for the fighters that there really needs to be. And yeah. I, I appreciated that you didn't pull any punches as you got to that point in the film, because as, it, as, as, as heartbroken as I was as a viewer in Nico's corner, hoping that this was going to be her opportunity to, to, to fight and to, to prove herself and to win, you know, for real as they wanted to, to paint it as right. um, you didn't, you didn't turn away from the, from, from the tragedy or the train wreck. And um, I really appreciate that in a film like yours, because it, it gives uh, a great deal of uh, investment. It, it, it pays the, it pays the viewer. And they mm -hmm. made the investment into the, the subject and, and they get the opportunity to see that fully realized. Um, was there ever a time that you were watching this go on and, and, mm. and felt like turning the camera off? Yeah, that is a great, great question. And, uh, you know, I've been in a lot of different situations through documentary. <laughs> I mean, I've been in the uh, deepest parts of Mexico where cartels run the region um, uh, uh, up where they transport different commodities, if you know what I'm talking about, and, and all kinds of situations. But uh, with Nico's, you know, as a documentarian, we try to take a fly on the wall approach as an observational documentary. Uh, doc verte, we call it, which is you're seeing the narrative and the story unfold without much interruption and guidance. You know, it's not a reality show of any sort. We may interject with a question or something of that nature to figure something out, but 
when things are happening the way they would happen normally in a fight camp for a fighter, or in Nico's case, the, the, this weight cut, the water cut, um, you generally, you know, it's, it's like you saw in the movie, we, we had patrons of this five-star high-end hotel in Dallas at five, six in the morning, these guys are going through their normal sauna routine in their towels, ready to kick off the day and relax. And they see two, you know, three bald guys, myself and uh, her boyfriend, Steve and Clint, you know, with tattoos and everything huddled over this woman who is literally dying on the floor. And they're walking up saying, hey, I'm going to call 911. What is going on here? This is nuts. Not only that, when we were in the hotel room, the hotel room was calling up there saying, we're getting complaints that something is going on up there, that someone may be dying. We're sending paramedics. Uh, you know, people are calling and complaining about this issue. So this is, <laughs> you know what I mean? For myself to hold my breath, you know, as I'm filming and talking, you know, on the side with, with her boyfriend, Steve, and sometimes Clint and, and even Nico herself, you know, I, I'm doing my best to uh, support them by documenting her journey and letting it play out where it's supposed to be out play out. Clint is the nutritionist, the performance specialist. This is his job to keep the fighter safe. He is, you know, got a Cornell education on this type of stuff. And uh, who am I to interject? It'd be like one of the fighters trying to tell me what to capture when I film a project, you know, maybe they could help, maybe not, but it's really not their place. And for us, uh, the way we shoot our documentaries is to let things unfold the way they're going to unfold, uh, to let a real narrative play out in front of you like it did in Warrior Spirit so that so the audience can grasp the emotion uh, of this situation without interjection. I really kind of felt like I was watching one of those nature documentaries where the seal is getting <laughs> eaten by the uh... – by the orca or the polar bear starving to death. Like it really felt like that kind of situation. I, I got to ask you like as sure. a documentary filmmaker and your commitment to that, that fly on the wall mentality, like mm -hmm. how do you sort of quiet your own fears about yeah, uh, what you may, what you may just, you might capture this woman's death on camera. What, what makes any good documentary or movie or book or story is, is in it. Uh, connection with emotion, creating empathy with the character. The reason why people resonate so much with Nico's story is that she is a wonderful, great hero. Her father died when she was 16 in, in, in a car accident. Her father was a fighter. Through mixed martial arts, she's able to live and feel that connection. That's why she goes to the extremes she has gone to, to try to cut weight and make these fights and also she became a UFC champion. Um, but that being said, art and documentary film is a way to hold a mirror up to ourselves. It shows us what it means to be human. And it gives us a chance to look back at ourselves and think about some of the decisions we're making in our lives and whether they're right or they're wrong and uh, how things can be maybe improved or, or left alone. And uh, that's why we film the films that we shoot the way we do is because we want the audience to make those decisions, not us. So in our film, we presented all sides of the story. We showed the UFC trying to help her. We showed when her camp sent her out on a fight appearance, you know, the week or two before uh, fight week and it didn't work out well. Uh, you know what I mean? There wasn't a bias uh, slant in the film. So when you present all sides and people come to their own conclusions, that's when you get the best conversation and be best movement for change and the best chance to see uh, what things are really about. <clears throat> well, I really have to commend you because the film comes across as very balanced. It comes across as showing you what is, not, what, not through some filter or through some lens. Um, and the only real bad guy in the whole thing is the journalist with his uh, tweets. But otherwise, you know, everybody is sort of painted in a, in a pretty neutral light. Ariel Hawani, the journalist in the film, uh, you know, he's he's another guy who's been ostracized by Dana White for trying to tell the truth, 
for reporting some of the the more dark stories in the UFC and MMA. And uh, he's also had to go totally independent to be able to tell those stories as a proper journalist and, and not just under the guise of propaganda MMA media for the UFC. So <laughs> he's not the bad guy either, obviously. And I know you're joking, but uh, it's funny because they can try to spin things that way to make it look like it's them or, you know, it's Nico's camp or it's Nico herself. And that's that's the problem. And that's why you got to present all sides to try to show and let people judge for themselves where some of the change needs to come from. I think it's um, it's it, it, it's interesting if you look at the UFC as a, a machine that sells attention. They, that's that they happen to be um, showing fights, but they're, they're, they're really selling attention. And it's a me- it's, it, it's it's a media company. It's a media company. It's a sports organization, but it's a media company. And they, they take a high value in that. And that's one of the reasons Dana White has been able to grow that sport as big as it is and to be able to compete with other franchises like the NBA's, the NFL's, the MLB's is because of their great work creating stars and uh, creating demand for, for the content. But with that comes the uh, um, important job of you know, taking care of people the right way, doing the right things. So that, that, that's what, you know, hopefully people will talk about and, and try to help improve fighter safety regulation, safety um, sanctioning around these things like extreme weight cutting and stuff like that, you know, health benefits, fighter pension, fighter pay. And uh, that's a microcosm for our society as well. Health benefits yeah. for, the, for the American worker uh, and, and those types of things, retirement, things that people aren't getting now people can't survive on one and two jobs anymore they have to have two or three just to pay off their rent and they can barely do that so there unfortunately it, it is a capitalistic society and uh you can get rich quick and uh, but it also is creating a wider and wider gap between between people trying to do the right things and, and people who are um rich because of generations before them and didn't have to do a whole lot um, oh so. yeah, I could talk to you for hours about uh, American <laughs> labor theory and how this is a microcosm for the for the perils of our society. But uh, yeah. I would be remiss if I didn't take the mm. opportunity to ask you about MMA and its relationship with Albuquerque and, and Nico and her relationship with Albuquerque. Uh, Albuquerque has such a rich fighting tradition, and a lot of champions have been made here. And it, it, N- Nico, being you know one of many that got an opportunity to train in Albuquerque, what was uh, can you I, I don't know can you kind of just speak yeah, yeah. to Albuquerque's that, relationship that, with MMA. That, Albuquerque is known for a few great things. Green chili, the balloon fiesta, breaking bad, and UFC champions, fighters, boxers, great wrestlers, MMA, um, mixed martial arts. So uh, the reason for that can be taken back to, to you know, it, In Albuquerque, unfortunately, there is a lot of poverty and um, a lot of things going on that cause people to have to look over their shoulder and fight to protect themselves. So that's part of the culture in Albuquerque, whether people want to admit it or not. And uh, that's why it breeds so many great fighters. Um, We don't have pro sports in Albuquerque per se. So the fighters are the pro athletes. They are the, what the kids look up to, Nico Montano, um, but all the other fighters that are from there, Holly Holm, um, even people, great people like Diego Sanchez, who's had a, a rocky career, but they know the guy has a heart of gold. You know what I mean? And, and he truly is a great, great person. Tim Means as well, you know, a guy who gives back to the community, teaches the kids, you know, same with what Tom and Arlene and those guys do at their gym, trying to help the community with giving them something positive to do. So fighting is part of the culture and part of the fabric of Albuquerque, and that will never change. That will never change, and that's why they breed some of the best fighters in the world. <laughs> I love it. Uh, I, I could go on for hours talking to you about this subject. I just think it's so deeply interesting. We do have to wrap it up, so I want a huge thank you uh, for, for bringing this film uh, and bringing these issues to light and presenting it in, in such a way. Uh, I'm going to send it back to Ivan. My name is James Glover on behalf of everyone. 
thank you, Landon. Thanks uh, from all of us here at AFMX. We really appreciate you taking the time to, to sit and talk with me. Thank you to everybody who watched Albuquerque Film and Music Experience Festival. Ivan, the whole team. Hey, go out, support the film, share the teaser, Warrior Spirit teaser, which is on YouTube. Tweet the UFC and Dana White, hashtag Warrior Spirit. Tell them changes need to be made. You guys support Nico Montano. She is not a scapegoat for this. She's a vehicle for positive change. We appreciate everybody's support and get ready because we got a lot more coming up with the film in the coming months. It's only. Oh, we lost him at the very end there. Oh, we lost him at the very end. Because well, of cutoff I... time and eventive, right? Melody? Oh, no. The cutoff time, and you're on mute. So cutoff time and event was. Oh. Oh. All right. Well. All right. Well, you know uh, what? Okay. Ladies if we and just, gentlemen, thank you. If we just lost him, if we just lost him, let me tell you something. What an impactful film. Oh no, Melody's on the live stream. <laughs> what is, okay. So. Pay no attention to the man. Thing, but let me just say this: what an impactful film, and I think it's a subject matter that. You know, people who even watch UFC didn't know about, and you know, it, it's it needs to turn into a movement to stop this from happening for the safety of uh, athletes. So, wow. One of my <clears throat> one of my favorite quotes is "Only through solidarity can change be made." So, uh, I, I think yeah. this is a perfect example of exactly that. Totally, totally agree. So, on that note, I mean, we have another block coming up at nine o'clock. Um, some incredible shorts, a little on the dark side. Thus, we brought brought them Friday night at nine o'clock. Q and A to follow with the filmmakers, and um, yeah, just want to thank everybody for joining us. Remember, all the conversations, Q and As, center stage conversations are available uh, through October eleventh. You can go to our website or through our uh, page on eventive.com. and um, stay tuned for the next next event and for the weekend. Um, tomorrow we have incredible films throughout the day, starting at about 11 a.m., uh, running into the evening. Um, great uh, featured feature film tomorrow night called Bone Cage. Great independent film, uh, Q and A's throughout the day with uh, moderators. There's no center stage conversations tomorrow because we're really saving some good ones for Sunday. Uh, make sure you get your tickets for Ray Seahorn from Better Call Saul. Uh, 9 30 on sunday morning and then at 2 30 p.m the god icon buffy saint marie intimate conversation just talking about the wisdom of buffy saint marie so um thank you again for joining us uh james thank you all the behind the scenes with melody and kira um have a great night everybody Get up and